and all sorts of things. But so then, based on that, the people who were growing up, growing up reading Verne and H.G. Wells and other writers of that ilk, uh, they started uh, publishing pulp magazines, some of them. And there was a guy named Hugo Gernsback in the 20s who came up with a, a magazine called Amazing Stories. And this is a later much later version of that magazine. But Hugo Gernsback is sort of the father of modern science fiction because he published magazines on science and magazines on science fiction. He coined the term scientifiction, and which is a sort of a precursor to science fiction. And uh, the Hugo Awards, which is, uh, there's two great awards in science fiction. The Hugos giving out of the world, given out at the World Science Fiction Convention and the, uh, the Nebulas given out by the Science Fiction Writers of America. Well, the Hugos are named after Hugo Gernsback. And this is what the Hugo awards look like. It's a rocket ship, as you can see, really cool and uh, beautiful award. And um, so Hugo Gernsback started publishing amazing stories and you could become, there was a fan club and there were readers and it came out monthly and it started publishing writers who were uh, who, be, who started having fan followings. Uh, writers like Jack Williamson and Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft was kind of on the bubble. He was writing horror stories, but more and more they started utilizing science fiction to give justification to the stories. Uh, Mountains of Madness is a great example of that. And uh, one of his... Uh, and so they started having these fan clubs, these science fiction fan clubs in New York, in Los Angeles, all over the country. And many of these readers were kids and teenagers, and many of them would grow up to be the great science fiction writers of the 30s and 40s and 50s and onward. And so, so one of the great science fiction fans was a guy named Forrest Ackerman, and that's him. There he is. He became the, uh, the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine and another magazine called Spaceman, which was short-lived. And he was also uh, an, a science fiction agent and science fiction book editor. I knew him personally. He had a great collection at his house that was open to the public, collection of props and memorabilia. He's a wonderful man and, uh, and a, a true inspiration. But he, as a young man here in Los Angeles, he was friends with, they started the Los Angeles Science Fantasy Association, LOSFUS, and, uh, and Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen and, and Forrest Ackerman were all members of that organization. They would meet regularly at Clifton's Cafeteria in downtown LA, and as teenagers they were publishing fanzines. These were mimeographed fan magazines with their opinions and their short stories and all sorts of things. And they were just kids, you know, 19, 20 years old, and Ray Bradbury had moved here with his family when he was 13 in 1933. And that's the same year that King Kong came out, and he was voraciously reading science fiction magazines and books. Now, let's back up a little, because we're not to the 30s yet. In 1912, 1912 was another very propitious year for science fiction, because two writers wrote two books that made a huge impression. The first was a young guy named Edgar Rice Burroughs, and then he wrote A Princess of Mars. This is 1912, and this is the first edition of that book. And uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, of course, is also known for Tarzan and many other books that he churned out. In fact, the, t the, the, the city of Tarzana here in the valley is named after Tarzan because that was actually a whole um, area that he owned, Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, for many years. And, uh, and, but that, that book, Princess of Mars, was made into a movie called John Carter that didn't do well, but it's a fun movie. You can watch it. I think you'll find it entertaining. But Princess of Mars spent, spawned many Mars novels, and Ray Bradbury read those books as a child. The first book he ever wrote was when he was 12. He was given a toy typewriter, and he wrote, wrote a sequel to John Carter of Mars, and he would step out onto his lawn in Waukegan, Illinois, uh, before he moved to Los Angeles, and he would put his arms up to the sky, and he would say, uh, Mars, take me home. And, uh, and so he's very strongly influenced by, by Edgar Rice Burroughs' adventure stories set on Mars. And they were about a, a, a warrior from the Civil War who ended up on Mars. And the, there were princesses to be saved and, and strange creatures to fight. And it was wonderfully evocative and imaginative. And it actually took several different books by others, kind of cobbled them together and synth synthesized uh, what they had done into this, this wonderful fantasy. But it made... It made uh, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' reputation, that and Tarzan, which also came out in 1912. Now, another writer who was already very famous in 1912 uh, came out with one of the other great science fiction books, The Lost World. And again, this is the first edition of The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle, and that is his great character, Professor Challenger. He, uh, he of course, created one other great character, um, Sherlock Holmes. And he did that in the 1880s, the late 1880s, 1887. But by 1912, he decided there was there were all these wonderful 
creatures being unearthed uh, there were dinosaurs in London and in America and uh, and even at the Crystal Palace exhibition in the 1860s, uh, or even 1850s, they're, they're, they exhibited dinosaur um, skeletons. And so, uh, so well, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle was definitely coming up amid that, that excitement about the new discoveries. And so he had the, the notion of a lost plateau in which you would find uh, dinosaurs that were still alive in, in South America. And of course, men, much of the world had not yet been mapped out. And so the idea of a lost world was very possible and very thrilling. Now later that was made into a wonderful silent film starring Wallace Beery as uh, Professor Challenger and this is actually the photoplay edition and it, this is the, uh, the frontispiece uh, from uh, when the movie came out in the 1920s and those are two stop-motion dinosaurs uh, that were animated by the great Willis O'Brien who later went on to do King Kong which was such a huge inspiration to uh, Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen uh, when they were teenagers. But, uh, but that's a great photo play edition. And uh, again, The Lost World is one of my favorite books. Uh, I can't recommend it too highly. There's audiobook versions of that as well. There's a great BBC um, adaptation of it that you can find, I'm sure, online. And um, I can't, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a wonderful imaginative story and, uh, and gets your imagination really going about dinosaurs in the, in the modern day and what would happen if they were alive. And now, nowadays we talk about bringing them back and Lost World, you know, the, the Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton hypothesizes that notion, which is very, very appealing. And, and Robert Backer has been talking about um, uh, bringing dinosaurs back, you know, reverse engineering a chicken to a dinosaur. And uh, I was saying, well, why not reverse engineer an ostrich, which would look much cooler as a dinosaur. No one wants a chicken dinosaur, a chickenosaurus. And uh, I actually emailed him and he said, well, ostriches are a little harder to handle than chickens, which is, well, okay, that's valid. So, so okay, so Amazing Stories comes out on the heels of all of this. And, and, and often Amazing Stories is republishing stories by H.G. Wells and, and Arthur Conan Doyle and, and you know, so forth, Edgar Rice Burroughs. And, uh, but they're also publishing new fiction. And so Amazing Stories pops up and you start getting um, other magazines. There's a bunch of these pulp magazines because they're cheap. You can read them. And as we move into the 30s, you've got science fiction fandom starting up. And you also have comic books. And in 1938, Superman comes out. Now that's very interesting because comics started utilizing the tropes of science fiction. So Superman wasn't brought made Superman by magic it was he was from an alien planet that had heavier gravity and uh, and a red sun and this is some of the mythology that got sculpted over the decades but but he was basically Superman because he came from an alien planet he was an alien who came in a rocket ship and so again uh, the tropes of science fiction were being used very effectively in comic books and this would continue through the 40s and 50s and to the present day so and many other magazines started popping up uh, among them a magazine it came, started coming out in the 30s called Astounding Science Fiction. This is the issue that deals with Destination Moon, which we'll talk about in the movie section of our, of our story. And, uh, but, but it was very influential. It wanted, John W. Campbell was the editor. He also wrote um, Who Goes There, which was made into two versions of The Thing, now I guess three versions of The Thing. And, uh, but he was a very good science fiction writer and a very good editor. And his idea was, let's have science fiction that isn't as fanciful, but is more science-based and realistic. And we started getting, and at the same time throughout the 20s, you start to have rocket scientists, both in um, America and in Germany. Robert Goddard in America, people like Hermann Oberth uh, in, in Germany, Tsiolkovsky in the Soviet Union. And, and they were doing, starting to explore rockets. Now, there was a, where, there was a weapons uh, use for missiles, of course. Uh, that what you would see in the V-2 and the V-1 rockets in World War II and later with the ICBMs throughout the world. But, but these guys who were launching these rockets, their eyes were on space. Their idea was to create rockets that could take us to the moon and the other planets and ultimately other solar systems. And the science fiction writers were also, in some cases, they were scientists themselves. They were all interested in science. And they were reading the science, and their stories were being informed by that. And so as we moved into the 30s and 40s and 50s, you started to get writers who were essentially uh, proselytizing for the notion of sending a man to the moon, sending people to Mars and outward. And it was this, uh, and many of them had come, for instance, Ray Bradbury, who was one of the great um, publicizers of that notion. He, his family had uh, come in covered wagons. They'd settled in Waukegan, Illinois. When, he, when his family moved uh, to Arizona and thence to Los Angeles, he saw the impact of colonizing on the Indians and, and the notion of 
coming from one place to another place to create a better life. And so that outward urge to, to, to go out into space was a very natural thing to him and to the others who would come up throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So in the 30s, you started to get some of the new writers, you started to see some of their work, but then World War II happened. Now, one thing I should mention is in 1939, they had the first World Science Fiction Convention, and Forrest Ackerman was going from Los Angeles to New York, but Ray Bradbury couldn't afford to go, so Forey loaned him a hundred bucks for a round trip um, train, ticket, train ticket or bus ticket to uh, the first World Science Fiction Convention, and Ray went there. He was a teenager, and uh, he uh, was only 19 at the time, and he um, and he he told me about it. It was amazing because again, the science fiction fans were only maybe a few thousand at most. It was a very small community, primarily male, and um, and and they were all reading all the stories. You could read all the stories. Science fiction was uh, paying maybe a penny a word for a story or five cents a word for a story at most. There were mainstream writers writing for what were called the slicks. These this is when you can sell stories to magazines and actually make a living doing it. Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, etc. There was a very good magazine market, but most of these science fiction writers weren't able to write for those markets. Science fiction wasn't being published in those markets, and so they were writing for Amazing Stories and Astounding and so forth, and longing for a better Better, better life, and so they were either having to write in a, at a crazy fast rate, uh, or uh, they had to work other jobs. And so, so this was just something to be mindful of. And science fiction novels were being published few and far between. And uh, so, but the 1939 World's, uh, World Science Fiction Convention started the notion of science fiction conventions. It's been held every year since, except for during World War II, when many of the uh, science fiction writers actually went into service and. Uh, but um, but it's continued ever since, and I just attended it a few weeks ago, the, the most recent one. So, but there was a sense of community, a sense of all of them knowing each other, a sense of the fans, many of them becoming the professional writers, and you and you started to have writers like um, uh, Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov and uh, Heinlein and um, yeah, A. E. Van Vogt and so forth. These were writers who were starting to know each other, starting as fans, becoming professional writers. Now, then the war hits, and it kind of puts stop to a lot of it, even though science fiction stories are still being published. And some science fiction writers were starting to write about atomic bombs and things like that. Wells had actually written about atomic bombs in the world set free before, uh, I think even before World War I. But, uh, but the ones who are writing now about it were um, writing it very scientifically accurately. And so the, uh, you know, the FBI actually showed up on one science fiction writer's door and kind of was worried that he might have somehow been breaking uh, security and might be a spy, but then it turned out that he was just reading the publicly uh, published scientific papers and extrapolating, and so he wasn't sent off to prison. But, uh, but so then after World War II, uh, science fiction really got going in earnest, and a lot of these writers came back from the war, and they started writing uh, science fiction on a monthly basis, and you start to get um, writers uh, writing in the late 40s into the early 50s who would become the major writers of the last half of the, of the 20th century. And so, and you start to get certain magazines like Galaxy Magazine, which was published by H.L. Gold. This is the first publication of Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. It's titled The Fireman. This is the, it's the cover story, and uh, wonderful. So you started to get Ray Bradbury, and then there was another magazine that started up in the 50s called Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. This is the special Mark Zickery issue. I actually painted that cover in my 20s. But, but Ray Bradbury was one of the great, great writers. There would, you would essentially get four major writers who were the prophets of the space age, and they would be on television shows talking about the moon landing and, and, and talking about why we had to go out in space, and they were popularizing that notion to the public. So the scientists and the military and the government on one hand were, were doing the actual creation and invention, and the science fiction writers were popularizing it to the public so that they would then be eager to finance these expeditions. So, <clears throat> so Ray Bradbury started writing a series of Martian stories, and in 1950 this came out, The Martian Chronicles. This is the first edition of that, and uh, you can see it's signed to me by my dear friend Ray Bradbury, and, uh, and there's Ray. <laughs> When he wrote it in, in 1950, the stories were written in the late 1940s, but he linked them together into one great narrative of the colonization of Mars, the first landings on Mars, the colonization, the uh, wholesale extermination of the Martians, how 
Mars Reasserts Itself. It's a great book. I, it's one of my favorites, and I love it. And, and we, Ray and I talked extensively about it. Uh, I was actually going to do a miniseries called Lost Mars that was based on the 22 Mars stories that aren't in the Martian Chronicles. And, uh, we'll talk, and I've talked about that on Mr. Sci-Fi uh, on other videos. But, uh, but Ray was a dear man and a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writer. And uh, so Ray started writing now, but there was the issue of how do you make a living as a science fiction writer? And this was a great um, challenge. Now also, although I said that science fiction was primarily male dominated, there were science fiction writers who were writing, uh, who were women. And often they would write under pseudonyms where it would sound like they were men. So for instance, C.L. Moore was one of those. Um, Andre Norton was another. Uh, you also had um, Lee Brackett, who was Ray's great mentor and teacher. He also knew C.L. Moore and her husband, Henry Kuttner. And, uh, and 